Hello. Welcome to Raymond Castile's basement of horror. This is the exciting season finale. I call it the exciting season finale with a bit of tongue in cheek. The final episode is usually something very personal and offbeat. And uh, certainly this is personal and offbeat. This is different from what we usually discuss here. But I, I hope it is kind of exciting. I hope you do find it at least interesting. We're going to talk about Coffin Joe. Coffin Joe is the Americanized name for a character named Zedu Kaisho. Zedu, Joe of Kaisho, the coffin. Joe of the coffin. Coffin Joe. Zedu Kaisho. He is an iconic Brazilian horror character. He's played by José Mujica Marins, who unfortunately passed away in 2020. Mujica created Coffin Joe, stars as Coffin Joe, directs, writes and directs the Coffin Joe movies. He is the Coffin Joe phenomenon. He is the auteur of Coffin Joe. The first Coffin Joe movie was At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, which is, this is the poster. This is not an original vintage poster, this is a reproduction. But uh, this is the poster art for At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, the first Brazilian horror movie. It was a big hit in Brazil. It introduced Coffin Joe and started a, a series of Coffin Joe movies that continued through the 70s. And then there was a long break and Mojica came back in 2008 with the final Coffin Joe movie. The series starts with At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul and then continues with This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse. And then that continuity stops and we have an alternate universe, Coffin Joe, in several other movies. And then in 2008 we pick up on that original story continuity to finish that story with Embodiment of Evil in 2008. That's the final Coffin Joe movie. Coffin Joe is an undertaker. He wears a black top hat and a black suit and a black cape. And he has long fingernails and he has a black beard and a unibrow. He's an atheist, a philosopher, but sort of a crackpot philosopher, like a, like a Charles Manson kind of a crazy philosopher, but he, he fancies himself a philosopher and he believes that the only way to achieve immortality is through the continuity of the blood, meaning by having a child. Only through your children, by re reproducing, can you have immortality. Coffin Joe doesn't believe in heaven or hell or the afterlife, or the supernatural. So he searches for what he considers a perfect woman to bear his child. This perfect woman would be cold and cruel like him, devoid of messy emotions, devoid of religion or superstition, He's looking for a very particular personality type with a certain outlook. And of course, she has to be beautiful. And that's his superior woman. He f considers himself the superior man. And he's looking for the superior woman. And then, then they'll get together and they'll have perfect children 
and he'll have a, a son who will be this Messiah because two perfect people come together to have this perfect son who will be a Messiah who will save the world from superstition and ignorance and lead humanity to this golden age. And he thinks that's his mission. That's his, he's got to have this son so his son can save the world. And in the process of trying to find this perfect woman and have the son, he massacres countless people over the course of several films. Anyone who stands in his way of achieving this dream dies. He kills people in various horrible, hideous ways. To find his superior woman, he tortures women to see how they react to the torture. And if they react the right way, then he says, aha, I found one. I found uh, my mate. And if, if they don't pass his tests, well, of course, they die. And if their boyfriends or fathers or husbands come looking for them, they die. If the authorities or bounty hunters come after Coffin Joe, well, he kills them. He kills anybody who messes with him. And at the end of the second film, This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse, he sinks into a, a swamp at the end of the movie. The angry villagers surround him, and they're going to finally put an end to him. And originally, uh, Mojica, the director, creator, star of these movies, wanted Coffin Joe to, to go down defiantly, cursing God to the end, and, and not repent. But the Brazilian government, and this is the 1960s, the Brazilian government, which was a dictatorship, at the time, um, forced Mujica to change the ending so that instead Coffin Joe finds God. So in the very end of the movie, after he's been killing people and saying and doing blasphemous things and being an unrepentant atheist through the whole film, at the very, very end, he finds Jesus and he asks for a cross but it's too late and he sinks beneath the water and he's dead. The end. And Majiga hated that. He couldn't stand that ending. He thought it ruined the movie. He thought it put a curse on him. That ending that was imposed on that film. And it haunted him all through his life for decades the, that his his masterpiece was marred by this government-imposed ending. In 2006, he started producing the third film in that trilogy. At Midnight I'll Take Your Souls, the first film, 1964. This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse is the second film, 1967. That's the one where he sinks into the swamp. And then the third film in this trilogy is Embodiment of Evil, released in 2008. And again, in between, there are other Coffin Joe movies, but they're a different continuity. There are different alternate universe versions of Coffin Joe. That original Coffin Joe is only in the first two movies and the last movie. So he's, he's shooting this last movie in 2006. And one of the things that is most important to him in, in making this third film is to fix the ending of that second film, to, to retcon that ending and lift that curse. So he, Bajika, wanted a flashback that shows how he survived that swamp and why is he still alive now in the present day. 40 years later, and in the flashback, he comes back up out of the swamp. It, it, it picks up right where that 60s film left off. He comes back up out of the swamp, and again, he, everyone's surprised. Why is he alive? He, he asks for the, the cross like he did in the previous film, 
and the priest who has, who's trying to convert him gives him the cross and he said he kills the priest and a police officer attacks him and he, he gouges the p police officer's eye out and he's it's the unrepentant deadly monstrous coffin joe that Mujika wanted in the first place and so he reshot that ending and made it look like it was old footage, like made it look like it was vintage 1960s footage, so it fit perfectly with the previous film. In this flashback, it rewrites the ending of the previous film. And then we can continue now with this new and final adventure with this much older Coffin Joe in what was then present day Brazil, still trying to find his superior woman and uh, I won't say whether he does or not, or whether he has the child or not. You'll have to see that movie. I discovered Coffin Joe thanks to my brother, Gamal Castile. I had heard of Coffin Joe since early 1990s, I'd, but I thought he was a horror host, like Sven Gugli. And he was, among many other things, Mojica is a Renaissance man, or was, and yes, Mujica was a horror host on TV, and he, and he had a talk show on TV. He had an a couple of anthology shows on TV. He did a lot of TV. But I thought that's what he was mainly known for. I didn't know he was a, a movie star, a movie character, a movie director. So I'd heard of him, and I knew that he was someone important. But it wasn't until Fantoma, a video, home video company, released this coffin-shaped box set of Coffin Joe movies. I think it was the year 2000, or if it wasn't 2000, then it was early early 2000s. They released this box set, and you could find it anywhere. I mean, it was widely available in the United States. And they also released uh, the films in the box set individually, so you could buy them individually, or you could buy them in the box set. And I saw this at Best Buy and other other stores, and I would look at this box, and I'd, and I'd look at the individual films, and I'd say, I know I'm going to like this. I know this is something I want to watch. But it was so expensive, the the set was a lot of money back, you know, for the time. And I'd look at that price, and I'd go, ah, oh, I can't, and I'd put it back on the shelf. And I thought, maybe I'll ask someone to get me that for Christmas. <laughs> that was my thinking. I didn't, though. And then Christmas, I think it was Christmas, comes along, and then I see a, I didn't mention this to anybody, and then I see a gift wrap coffin-shaped box. And I, I knew exactly what it was, and it was my brother had given this to me, and I said, is this the Coffin Joe box set? And he said, open it and find out, and I tore it open, and it, that's what it was. I don't know how he knew that I wanted that. I think he just saw that it was shaped like a box, shaped like a, a coffin. So he thought, well, Raymond would like that. I never mentioned it to anybody, but um, that was a good gift. <laughs> so I remember watching those films for the first time and just being blown away. I thought, boy, where have these movies been my whole life? This is, these are the movies that I imagined in my dreams but but never uh, they they never existed. These are the movies that it was almost like they were pulled from my subconscious and put on the screen. They were like the, 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 it was like um like a lost mythology that was part of my DNA, but had not survived like like an oral tradition. It was just sort of embedded in me, and now. I discovered the sacred scrolls and <laughs> finally read the this lost myth that I'd somehow intuitively known my whole life, but now I'm actually experiencing it. They had a big impact. Um, and there was something, though they were uh, mostly black and white, there was this quality about them that made you feel like like you shouldn't be watching it. It was like, like reading some Lovecraftian forbidden text. 
uh, there was something very dangerous about those movies, even though they were very old. They had a, um, a very transgressive quality. Uh, it was like you were dabbling in things you should leave alone. It really was a, a kind of a spiritually scary feeling watching them. They did their job. And I can only imagine the 1960s how audiences must have felt watching that stuff. They're very sexual, very violent, and they're hard to watch even by today's standards. Even now, I can imagine people watching those and just not being able to look at the screen uh, or feeling spiritually poisoned watching them. They're there's something very evil and insidious and dark. <laughs> they come from a dark place. And it makes it, but the thing is, at the same time, they're tremendous fun. And, and that's something horror has lost today. I've said this before. I hate films like like Hereditary, I haven't seen, what's it called, Bo is Afraid or whatever. I haven't seen that. I'm not going to see it. I don't like Ari Aster. Uh, I'm not going to see things like um, Speak No Evil, stuff like that. I'm not watching that stuff. I'll watch Coffin Joe, but I won't, wa I won't watch that stuff. Because I feel like that stuff, even though it's not nearly as violent, not nearly as... Um, certainly not sexual, we, we can't be sexual in today's movies, forget that. I feel like those movies are, have more of a sickness of the soul than Mujica's films. There's something about these, some of these modern films, they're so relentlessly dark, but it's, they're not fun. There's nothing fun about them. Horror's lost its way as far as being fun is concerned. I remember when horror could be so, so dark and still be fun. You still felt glad that you'd watched the movie, even though it was very dark. And, and Coffin Joe was like that. It's very dark, but you, you're glad you watched it. You, you have fun. You enjoy yourself. It's terrible stuff happening, but it's fun. And, uh, spoiler alert, have being able to get to know Mujica personally, I can tell you he's a very good-hearted, was a very good-hearted man, a very thoughtful man, a very gentle man. He had a very, very good heart, a good soul, but he was an artist, and these movies are works of art. They're dark, but they're their art, like uh, looking at a painting by Bacon or, or Goya or something that's dark, but it's enriching at the same time. Uh, these films are not just entertainment, they're also truly artistic films, and Mujica went to war to make these things. He, he's in a, I know it's not uh, kosher to say this anymore, he was in a third world environment. No money, no industry to make this stuff. No support. Uh, government dictatorship that hated what he was doing. Everything was against him. He wasn't doing this to to get rich. He was doing this because he was an artist and he had to, he had something to say, something to express. It was very unique, something about the human experience and the human condition and what it means to be a human and what it means to be alive, something very, a very unique perspective that he had to get out. And this was, in, he was a, a macabre artist. Horror was the vocabulary he used like Edgar Allan Poe or so many other artists 
who, for whatever reason, that's the language that makes sense to them, the language of horror. It's the language that makes sense to me. And that's the language he used, that's the palette he used to create his art. And as Coffin Joe, the character himself, says, his movies are strange, but never corrupting. They feel corrupting. <laughs> But when you take it all in, they're not. I think, I think you learn something about the human experience watching them. So it sounds like, like heady stuff. They're, they're scary, they're dark, they're nightmarish, they're surreal. And some of them are psychedelic. Some of them, some of the later ones are a little rough in terms, technically. The, the earlier ones are more accomplished technically, because you know, budgets went down and the movie in Brazil, the movie business, it really wasn't much of a business, that changed and Mujica's fortunes changed. and So some of the 70s movies are a little harder to get through, but they're all outsider art. They're, they're, they're fun, but they're also works of art. And Mujica was, I think, a great artist uh, and I'm not the only one to say that unfortunately he's gone he died in 2020 just as the uh, pandemic was <laughs> starting up around the world <sighs> um, at the time he died I said and this was repeated but uh, by people who who knew him, who were being interviewed, um, they repeated this comment that I made. It, it seemed as though Majika had been holding the world together, and then as soon as he died, the world fell apart. And that is how it seemed. Just as soon as he died, that's when COVID just went nuts, and, and, and everything got locked down, just like, you know, week or two weeks after he died. So how did I know him? Well, <clears throat> I was a big Coffin Joe fan. Still, obviously, as you can tell, still still am. Um, but I was really, for a while, just, just hyper about Coffin Joe, and I, and I created a, a cosplay of Coffin Joe because I noticed he looked a lot like me, the young Mojica in those movies looked a lot like me, or I looked a lot like him. It was kind of uncanny how, how much I resembled him. So I thought, well, hey, you know, I can, I can do a cosplay of this. And I just, I, you know, when you discover something new, you want to tell everybody about it, you, you want to you wanna spread, the world, spread the word and get other people excited about it, and you want to sort of connect with it somehow. Uh, and that's what I wanted to do. So I made, I went to a lot of trouble to make a really nice cosplay uh, of Coffin Joe. And my friend Max Cheney took pictures of me in a cemetery. Because, as I said, Coffin Joe is an undertaker. So uh, he took pictures of me in a cemetery that looked like, uh, like scenes from a Coffin Joe movie. And I put these online. This was before social media, so this is a uh, old style HTML website. I stuck these pictures on there, and then in Brazil, Mexica was getting interviewed for a, I don't know a magazine or newspaper or something, and uh, the journalist illustrated the interview using pictures of me. He went online and just you know. I don't know. I don't remember if Google was around yet or not, but he did a, used a search engine, and he found pictures of what he thought was Coffin Joe, but it was in fact pictures of me. And he used these pictures to illustrate the interview with Mujica. So Mujica was looking at that and was thinking, "When did I take these pictures? I don't remember that photo shoot." 
and his wife at the time uh, looked up, I don't know how she found it online, but she, she found me online. She found those pictures online and told him, that's not you, that's this guy from Missouri in the United States. And, and Mujica was amazed. And through his assistant director, Denison Romalo, that's a anglicized pronunciation of his name. Uh, I'm not going to mangle it trying to pronounce it authentically. Denison, his assistant at the time, emailed me and told me Coffin Joe saw my pictures and, and loved it and thought it was great. And I was, wow, Coffin Joe saw my website. Isn't that amazing? And he likes my pictures. <laughs> I was really excited. And again, this is before social media. This is before, long before you could go on Twitter and talk to celebrities and, and have contact with them. That, that was before that world existed. This was at a time when it was still very exotic to have any contact with a famous person. And I knew at the time that Mujica was making Embodiment of Evil. I don't know if I knew the title or not, but I was actually reading Brazilian entertainment news and using online translators, because Brazil they speak Portuguese. And I was using translators to read these entertainment articles about the progress of this film, because I was obviously very interested in this new Coffin Joe movie. It was the first new Coffin Joe movie in many, many years. And I didn't know that he was going to do this flashback this way. Or maybe I did, but um, I, didn't, I didn't know all the details about what he was going to do. But a few months after that initial email, he, through Denison, he emailed me again. And this time the subject line of the email was, Do you want to be Coffin Joe? And I remember reading that email and just the hair on the back of my neck just stood up. Do you want to be Coffin Joe? <laughs> so I read the email. I was, I was I'm kind of shaking now thinking about it. He wanted me to play the young Coffin Joe in this flashback scene. He said he, they, they tested Brazilian actors. Nobody else looks like Coffin Joe the way I do. So to make a very, very long story short, I flew to Brazil and I played the young Coffin Joe in that flashback sequence coming up out of the swamp, killing the priest, maiming the cop, causing havoc, and connecting this Nile Possessor corpse with embodiment of evil. And that was quite as you might expect, quite an experience. And then I returned in 2008 for the premiere and attended the premiere and I was, I was interviewed by MTV and Rolling Stone and I was interviewed by all these different outlets and I was on uh, one of the biggest network TV shows they have there, uh, a big like, talk show, like a Tonight Show kind of a thing. It was it was a great experience, and the movie was distributed by 20th Century Fox. So it was a big release, big you know mainstream big release, and I sat there watching myself <laughs> on the big screen. It was something with the real Coffin Joe sitting a couple seats behind me. It was something. Uh, and I stayed in touch with Mujica, and unfortunately, and, and he he was going to make a movie called The Eater of Eyes, and through another assistant, not Denison this time, another assistant, he said he wanted me to be in that, but he wasn't sure what I was going to do, just he wanted me to be in it doing something. I don't know what I would have played, I was, whatever you want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm down. But he wanted to know, would I be okay being in the Amazon jungle? That's where he wanted to shoot it. And I said, sure thing. <laughs> sure. Um, but then he got sick. And uh, I never got to see him again in person. And 
for these last few years. I mean, he had all these other projects he wanted to do, but he didn't, he didn't get to do any of them. Uh, and finally, after a long illness, he passed away. O que é a morte? É o fim da vida. Outra informação, o cineasta José Mujica Marins, conhecido como Zé do Caixão, morreu hoje aos 83 anos em São Paulo. O ator, diretor e roteirista estava internado com uma broncopneumonia. Mais conhecido como Zé do Caixão, ele é considerado um dos maiores cineastas brasileiros e o pai do cinema de terror nacional. Vamos agora sobre a morte de José Mojica Marins, o corpo dele, conhecido aí pelo personagem Zé do Caixão. Eu da imagem do som que está sendo preparado, o corpo chegou a quase uma hora e a partir que foi levado o criador do Zé do Caixão. E só com o reconhecimento internacional dele como um pioneiro no gênero de horror no Brasil... É que... hoje em São Paulo o cineasta José Mujica Marins, mais conhecido pelo principal personagem criado por ele, o Zé do Caixão. Ele tinha... mais famoso diretor do gênero do horror no Brasil, José Mujica, iniciou a carreira no cinema na década de 1950. Mas... Ainda não há informações sobre o velório e o enterro de José Mujica Marins. José Mogi Camarins, nosso querido Zé do Caixão, ah. genial, Zé. É, durante a tarde da última quarta-feira, o cineasta José é, Mogi Camarins... Às quatro horas houve um pequeno atraso, mas muitos fãs já estão aqui, ao local, aqui no local, fazendo filas, todo mundo querendo se despedir do Zé do Caixão, lembrando... Quem não cresceu assistindo aos filmes e também acompanhando as histórias de Zé do Caixão? José Mogi Camarins morreu no Hospital Santa Maggiore por volta de 4 horas da tarde aqui em São Paulo. Como vocês disseram, ele tinha 83 anos e deixa sete filhos. Ele estava internado desde o dia 28 de janeiro com broncopneumonia. Uma das filhas dele, a atriz Liz Marins, confirmou que o velório acontece amanhã a partir das 4 horas da tarde aqui no MIS, que é o Museu da Imagem e do Som. O enterro vai acontecer na sexta-feira, mas ainda não tem local definido. Zé do Caixão teve uma longa carreira no cinema e na televisão. Aliás, ele apresentou um programa aqui na TV Bandeirantes e atuou em mais de 50 filmes de terror. So, that was a sad day for me. I, I saw it coming. I think all of his fans and people knew him. We saw it coming, but still it didn't make it any, any easier when it finally happened. Now this, this poster, like I said, is a reproduction. <coughs> um, Mujica, as far as I know, owns the only existing copy of the original poster. I think there's only one surviving copy, and it's the one that his estate owns. And so he had this made, this reproduction. It's direct from his original. And this is, uh, he autographed it for me. And this is for my friend Raymond Castile. Uh, I think this is with hugs from Jose Mujic Marines, Zero Caixo. So there it is hanging there. So I was wondering how I was going to do this episode because, I mean, should I do it from a historical perspective, talking to you about who Coffin Joe is and the phenomenon of Coffin Joe? Should I talk about my experience or should I be more collector oriented and show you? stuff um so i guess my answer to all that was yes all of the above <laughs> so i've given you some historical background i've told you about my connection to coffin joe even though those movies were very very dark and strange and the government hated Mujica and wanted to shut him down they were a phenomenon in Brazil. He never made a lot of money off because just, just the, the economic reality of the situation. It didn't matter what he did. He would never have made a lot of money. Um, but that doesn't mean they weren't popular. They were very popular. They were a phenomenon for a few years in the, like the mid-60s into the early 70s. Coffin Joe was a, a big deal. Um, and, he, and throughout his life, Mujica was a big deal. But he fell on hard times in the 80s, but then made a comeback in the 90s. 
but he had really, he was in the 80s, he got to the point where he was uh, making porn films, he was going to birthday parties as Coffin Joe to make money, <laughs> like a clown. Just whatever you could do to make some money. It was pretty, pretty dark for a while in the 80s, but then, thank goodness, it turned around in the 90s. He had a comeback, and he was on TV again. He had multiple TV shows and radio shows and publishing and music stuff, just, you know, all kinds of multimedia stuff. And, and he did uh, very well his last 20 years of his life. Um, and in terms of fame, he was more famous than ever in his later years because he broke through to the American market. He had broken through to the French market in the 70s. Um, and I don't maybe the UK market, in, I don't know, a little later. But it wasn't until the 90s that he broke through to the US market, and that's when it just blew up. Um, and he had a kind of international stardom that he had never had before. He, had, he was a legend in Brazil, but now he was international. And I'm very glad that he, he had that second act later in life, and he got to make Embodiment of Evil, uh, and all the other things he got to do later in life. Um, he, he, everyone has to die sometime, but I really do think he had a happy ending in that he died knowing he was loved internationally, and that uh, although his, still, his work got a lot of disrespect from a lot of people, it also got a lot of respect it's particularly from people in film, both in Brazil and the U.S. Um, so I, I think, in the end, I, I think his story has a happy ending. But I want to talk about the phenomenon of Coffin Joe, because he was... Um, there was a lot of, surprisingly, a lot of merchandising in the 60s into the 70s. <sighs> Obviously, there were posters, not just movie posters, but posters you could buy, like, you know, commercial posters. There was a very uh, popular comic book that he published. There were novelties. There were physical novelties, but there were also novelty records. So there was music. He had two anthology, horror anthology, like Tales from the Crypt, type horror anthology TV shows, plus, in the 60s, plus he was on TV all the time as, as a guest on talk shows. Later, in the 90s and 2000s, he, had, he was a talk show host and a horror host and a radio host and, and did reality TV kind of stuff and all, all kinds of stuff later. But in the 60s, he did a lot of TV as well. There was a, a line of men's uh, cologne and, or deodorant or, I don't know, I, a couple different things. It was called Mysterio, and it was tied in with Coffin Joe. Um, and I know he complained that he never got paid for that or something. <laughs> he has a lot of, a lot of stories about uh, deals that didn't work out. And, but, and so it really was... It was a big deal for a while. And I don't have a lot of 60s Coffin Joe stuff. I have some important things, but that stuff is so impossible to find. Even Majika didn't have much of that. Or if he did, he had like one example of something. It was like the only example anyone ever saw, that <laughs> the only existing example. But um, let's see, where should I start here? <clears throat> Well, here are some uh, Brazilian DVD sets. That's not the coffin-shaped box from um, the United States. These are Brazilian sets.
And this one's autographed to me. Those are more recent. Well, you know, they're 21st century. Oh, there's Billy. These are the videotapes that really got his North American popularity off the ground. Something Weird Video started releasing these in the 1990s, the early 90s. And that's when an American fandom started to grow. And if something weird, I mean, there's a lot more than just these two. These are just representative examples. If something weird hadn't picked these up, I, I don't know how things would have evolved. I think, I think he still would have broken through in the United States somehow, but uh, this is, these are the things that finally did it, these videotapes. These VHS tapes. These are early 90s, but these are not how I discovered them. Oh, this one's autographed too. I didn't notice that. But not to me, the, a previous owner. That's got an autograph. So these are 1990s VHS tapes, and that's the United States North American fandom really started with that, with the Something Weird tapes. And then I discovered it. So th that, uh, that was like 10 years before I finally caught on with those DVDs. Go with this. I told you that uh, there were some novelty records this is a, a, a later edition of a couple of novelty songs that came out in the 60s. But the sleeve is a, a later edition. And here is a vintage LP that has those same two songs on it. This is more interesting. Ze Romalo. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. It's probably pronounced Hamayo, but uh, I don't know. My anglicized pronunciation is Romalo. So that's Ze Romalo. That's a singer. It's a pop star. Obviously, that's Majika there as Coffin Joe. And although this isn't an album of Coffin Joe singing or anything like that, he is, it's my understanding, he does have vocals on some of the tracks on here. And that guy in the middle, his name is Satan. And he was Coffin Joe's bodyguard for a long time. Even in the 2000s, he was still around. Coffin Joe had a entourage of people he, he stayed with for a long time, the same people that were with him in the 60s and 70s. A lot of them were still with him later on. I've never listened to this. this I don't really have a functioning LP player right now. Here's a little insert. It's got some art in there. Unfortunately, no no art of Coffin Joe in in this, but certainly quite a bit of Coffin Joe art in this. Uh, here we go.
trying to organize how can I show you this stuff. There's so many different things. I mean, I, I really can't show all of it. There's too much. Here is a Coffin Joe t shirt. I think that's a modern one. I saw something there. Sometimes I see things. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, this is... A medallion that he wears an embodiment of evil. It's not the screen used one, but he made two versions of it. I think he made 20 of each version. And he wears one in the movie, but then he made the extra ones available for sale. So he wears that on his neck. Some of this stuff is, a lot of this stuff is modern. I don't, I want to show you the older stuff. This is one of my, one of my favorite pieces. This came from a, there used to be a Coffin Joe Museum in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this was a souvenir that you could buy in the Coffin Joe Museum. This is a little Coffin Joe bust. It's kind of heavy. This is an official Coffin Joe souvenir from the Coffin Joe Museum in Sao Paulo. It's, it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, closed down. His family wants to get a new museum up and running. But uh, at the time, you could get stuff like that. And they had other, all kinds of other odd souvenirs and things you could buy. This is a, a program for a festival, I think, film festival or, or a special screening of At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul. So that's a still from At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul. There's a lot of other stuff in here, but I'm not getting all that out. Lots of stuff from the premiere of Embodiment of Evil. And I'm just trying to think how, how much do I want to get out of this box. And this is the this is the more modern collectibles box that I'm looking at, except for the records, those are older. But I have another box here 
that's like the good stuff, which we'll get to shortly. This is a garage kit, Coffin Joe. There are two garage kits, both, I think they're both unauthorized. This one definitely is. I know his, his daughter, her stage name is Liz Vamp. She was not happy that this kit was created. Distinctive Dummies made a Coffin Joe action figure that was licensed and they did, they did get permission for that. And here is an older Coffee Joe garage kit. I'm not sure what year this is. That's an older kit. I think that's I think it's 1990s. I think so. I said I didn't think either of them were authorized, but this one is, look at that, officially licensed. That one is authorized. This one's licensed. And that makes sense because Majika had a built up version of this in his museum, which he would not have had if it were not authorized because he didn't like unauthorized stuff. All right, let's look at some of the Embodiment of evil souvenirs. I'm not sure how much of this. <laughs> this is a napkin from a restaurant that I went to in Brazil. <clears throat> well, these are like uh, t-shirts and sweatshirts with the with the movie logo. Posters. What's something I, I can actually show you? This is a graphic novel that was a tie in for the movie that uh, talks. It, it's the story of what Coffin Joe is doing between the previous movie and the new movie. This is a retrospective of Majika's career that was done for a, a festival. This is definitely for a retrospective 50th anniversary uh, film festival where they showed a bunch of restored versions of Majika's films. And there's a, a lot of great pictures in this. I mean, the whole thing is just full of great imagery. And there is a, let me find a really nice picture here. Well, there's the poster that we have behind us. Tim Lucas has an essay in this where he mentions me and says some very flattering things about me. This is a really handsome book. Um, it's in Portuguese, but uh, even so, it's just a, a nice, uh, it's a nice resource. Even not being able to read <laughs> the text, it's a nice resource for soaking up a little bit about Majika's career. Here's some coffin, oh, here's an embodiment of evil um, artwork. That was a big standee that they had. So, so this big hand, it's about five feet tall, and that was a standee that they had in, in theater lobbies. Here's the movie poster. Um, magazine that was out the week that the movie premiered. And 
and I don't know if I, I don't think am I in this? I'm in a few magazines <laughs> that would talk about the movie. I don't know. Let's see if I am in this. I know there were a few magazines that had. Uh, yeah, I don't think I'm in this one. But there are, were a few magazines that had little things about me. There's the story about Coffin Joe. of this I can show. So that's the thing about showing Coffin Joe artwork is you can't really show much of it on YouTube. I'm just looking at these images. I can't show any of this. Yeah, I can't show that stuff. Uh, so I'll just leave that out. Okay, I think I need to clear out this modern stuff or semi-modern stuff and then cut and then we'll show some older stuff. So we're going to cut right now. We're back. Well, that was just a moment for you, but it's been a week for me. I've time jumped a week into the future. Obviously all the stuff is cleaned off and uh, I've had a week to think about things. <laughs> Uh, it, it seems like that past hour was very chaotic. I don't know if I really accomplished everything I wanted to. I, I know one thing I, I didn't do was really look at this garage kit the way I should have. I did not do this justice. Death, Death Incorporated, sculpted by Al Raboro or... Hmm, Reboiro? Don't know how to pronounce his name. But uh, it's Death Inc. Officially licensed Coffin Joe tribute. And as I said last time, well, just a few minutes ago for you, but a week ago for me, this is an officially licensed kit. And it's actually kind of an important piece. It includes an autographed certificate of authenticity. It's autographed by Mojica. The legendary screen actor, writer, producer, and director, Jose Mojica Marins. There's his autograph. The official licensed numbered death incorporated resin model kit so it's very much an authorized kit and it's very fragile i took all the styrofoam peanuts out now so i can see it but it's got a coffin piece like that and this feels like if you messed with it too much it would break and here's the part you want to see That's Coffin Joe in the coffin. So you can't take him out. He's stuck there. But there he is. Strong shadow on that. Wonder if all my lights are on. But anyway, that's that's good old Coffin Joe. He's, he's resting in the coffin, but it's meant to be propped upright. So it, when you assemble the model kit, the coffin is upright. And let's take a look at the very Aurora style base. It's got a lot of little spiders. And I think those are actual Aurora model kit spiders. I think he took those from an Aurora kit. I don't know about the skull, but the spiders look so familiar. Those have got to be actual Aurora spiders. If not, then it's quite a tribute to that style of sculpture. So very Aurora-esque. And then here's a tombstone. It's 
Scott Majika's name and Coffin Joe. Let's see if I can do this without destroying it. So you see the tombstone fits on it like that. And then the coffin fits on it like that with the tombstone next to it. And of course it's got the sides on the coffin. Uh, it's kind of kind of fragile. Let's see if I can do this without breaking it. There you go. There's no lid for the coffin. Ooh, it's pretty fragile. Let's see here. Special dedication, thanks to Jose Mojica Marines, Coffin Joe, for allowing Death Incorporated to license and release this model kit. I would also like to thank him for the many hours of viewing pleasure he's provided us through his many films. And he goes on to thank Kevin and Sue Clement. Is that how you pronounce it? Clement. They're the organizers of Chiller Theater, the convention. And Andre Barsinski, who is Coffin Joe's biographer. And Mike Vrainy, who has passed away but used to run something weird video. The company that put out these Coffin Joe VHS tapes, and that's really what got the ball rolling for Coffin Joe's popularity in the United States. And this kit, as I understand, was made to comm commemorate Coffin Joe's first trip to the United States to attend the Chiller Theater Horror Convention in 1994. So this is an old kit. This kit's quite old. And I, another thing I've been doing this week, <laughs> since the snap, um, another thing I've been doing is searching for a convention t-shirt from that convention. I have a, a 1994 Chiller Theater convention shirt that has Coffin Joe on it. It's got Zachary Lee, but I can't find it. And it really frustrates me. I've looked every closet, every drawer, every box that would make any sense, some places that wouldn't make any sense. And I cannot find that t-shirt. That, that upsets me. I cannot imagine where in the world that t-shirt could be. It's really strange. Well, anyway, unfortunately, I cannot show you that shirt, but I showed you the resin kit. And I do have a little piece of paper from that convention, which I'll show you in a little bit. I didn't go to that convention, no. I mean, it was a long time ago, and uh, I don't know how old I was at that point, but I, even though I was old enough to go to a convention like that, I wasn't <laughs> mentally old enough. I wasn't mature enough. To, to go to con fly to New Jersey and go to con a convention by myself. And, yeah, I was still just a little too young to be doing stuff like that. Okay, so that's that kit. And when I was showing it to you before, I really didn't register just how important that kit was. But that's a that's probably the first piece of license. Coffin Joe merchandise in the United States, and aside from these videotapes, I don't know, or maybe a, uh, anything that would have been released in conjunction with the videotapes, and I'm going to show you something in a minute. The Something Weird stuff and that kit are the first wave and probably the only wave of Coffin Joe memorabilia authorized, produced in the, in the United States. In Brazil, as we said, there was lots of stuff in the late 60s, and very little of that survives today. Uh, but I do have some interesting things that I will show you from the time of Coffin Joe's original films. Um, let's see, I think we'll s next 
let's look at some t-shirts that I do have. So these are the ones I, I could find. And that Chiller Theater shirt should have been right here with these, and I have no idea why it wasn't. That just really upsets me. <laughs> I've spent the last few days upset about that shirt. It's just, it's a historical thing. I cannot imagine where it is. It's not like I live in Wayne Manor and there's just so much space for it to be. There's only so many places it could be. Oh well, anyway. Um, what should I show you first? Unfortunately, I only have three. I should have a fourth one, but I don't. Let's look at this one. So this, I was just talking about something weird. This is a Something Weird Video t-shirt. That's an image from a Strange Hostel of Pleasures. The movie poster, a Strange Hostel of Pleasures. And that's a really nice Coffin Joe t-shirt. That might be my favorite Coffin Joe t-shirt. And the first time I saw this was in Los Angeles at the Egyptian Theater. I was, um, what was I seeing? I think I was seeing a double bill of Curse of the Werewolf and Brides of Dracula. Two Hammer films. Projected 35 millimeter, beautiful restored prints at the Egyptian Theater in Los Angeles. Of course, a whole audience full of horror fans. Uh, and I was leaving the theater after the, it was done. So it was the two movies, I was leaving the theater and someone had this shirt on. I didn't talk to him or ask him or like, hey, cool shirt. I didn't do that. I just acknowledged that I wish I had that shirt. <laughs> wow, look at that shirt. And it took me a long time to, to get one of my own, but I finally did. Here it is. That was put out by Something Weird Video when they released the videotapes in the 90s. And this is a designer shirt. That's a designer shirt from a, a fashion designer, and I will destroy his name, but it, it's Alexandre Hershkovich. Alexandre Hershkovich. Hershkovich. I think that's it. I'm American, sorry. I can't pronounce that very well. Forgive me. But he's very, he's a very big fashion designer in Brazil. And he created this line. I don't remember what year that was. Maybe 2003 or four or something like that. I'll look at the tag in a minute. That's his name right there. Designer's name. So he had a, a, a line that was very goth one year and it had this shirt as part of it. I think it had some other Coffin Joe related items in it. So I really wanted one of these shirts and uh, took a long time for me to get one. But I think it was Dennis and Romalo, Dennis and Romalo who gave me this shirt in, in Brazil. The anglicized pronunciation is Denison Romalo. That's how we say it in Missouri. And now let's look at one. Let's, this is a modern one, this one. That's Coffin Joe and his daughter, Liz Vamp. So this is a modern. I think you can still get this. So we got something weird. Alexandra Herskovich and Liz Vamp and Coffin Joe. The something weird one is 1990s. Herskovich is about 20 years old. And this Liz Vamp one is contemporary. I wish I had the the uh, 
Schiller Theater I wanted to show you, but I don't. Oh well. I'm sure I will discover it tomorrow. <laughs> then will I come back here and reshoot something and cut it in? Yeah, I don't think so. I gotta, gotta get this episode done and get it out to you guys. It's already take one top. Okay, you saw that, right? Okay, I, I don't know. That's spooky. I don't know what, what that was all about. Okay. Okay. And incidentally, even though Coffin Joe died, Mojica died right at the start of the COVID pandemic, as far as I know, he didn't die of COVID. He had been sick a long time and it finally got the better of him. But the timing was very odd. And just, it did feel like the world just died when he died and other people died at the same time. And when uh, another one of my heroes, Vangelis, died from COVID during the pandemic. A lot of good people died, but I feel like uh, not just people, but I feel like society died. We lost something that's not coming back. I showed you this toy already, but just for context, let's just take another look. This is the I didn't, I didn't have this, did I? I just mentioned it. Well, now you can see it. This is the Distinctive Dummies Coffin Joe figure. And this is licensed. This is a licensed figure. And it's sealed, so I'm not going to take it out of there. But it's a Mego style figure. And as far as I know, I think the head is resin. It's either resin or 3D printed. It's not, uh, it's not factory made, like injection molded or rotocast. It's hard. So, you know, it's a bit of a custom toy, but it's licensed. It's a, it is a licensed toy. Well, it's a collector's, it's not for kids to play with. I'd really like to see a company like NECA make a Coffin Joe figure. I feel like that'd be right up their alley. Um, I think that'd be cool for them to get into international characters like that. And I think their customer base would like it. You know, if, so Aero Video is working on a, a Coffin Joe Blu-ray set. <sighs> What's going to happen with it, I don't know. I think they they have some challenges that they run into, but hopefully that'll get off the ground and that'll get out and it'll be great. And uh, perhaps that would be an opportunity for NECA to make a toy to go with that, like a promo. That's the kind of thing Severin would do. That's not really the kind of thing Arrow would do, but you know, we'll see. It's just I'm looking for some excuse for NECA to make a toy. I wouldn't imagine that Mego would ever do it. And I don't see Mezco doing it. If any mainstream toy company is going to do it, and you know, Super 7 is not going to do it, if anyone's going to do it, I think it's, I think NECA is the best chance. Not that I really expect it to happen, but it would be nice. Okay. So this is a one of a kind custom. Coffin Joe figure. This was made by my good friend Matt J. Cox. Mage. That's his company name. His imaginary company. Mage. And he made that for me. Oh, was it 2007? Something like that. Two thousand seven, yes. 
he's got this artwork on the back taken from a Coffin Joe comic book. He's got some interesting characters on the sides. Now this is not sealed, so do I dare open this? It hasn't seen the outside air in years and years and years. so long I'd hate to mess it up now oh there it goes all right there's coffin Joe You can see his hands there. He's got talons. Now, I think those hands came off a, an Ozzy Osbourne figure. Like I said, this is a one-of-a-kind custom toy. This isn't a mass-produced toy. He's got his medallion there. Matt made three of these. One for me, one for him, and one for Majika. And I, I contacted one of Mujica's associates and told him I wanted to send, send this toy to Mujica. And he said, sure thing. And then I gave him the address. And, or I mean, he gave me the address and I sent it. But as far as I know, Mujica never got it. I don't know what happened. I, I don't know how things are now, but at the time, if you wanted to give something to Majika and make sure he got it, you really needed to stand there and hand it to him. And I wish I would have been in a position to do that, but I just wasn't. Because I know he, Majika would have got a kick out of the toy, and Matt would have got a kick out of Majika having the toy. And I... Maybe it's in Brazil somewhere. And you know, maybe it's possible Mujica got it and just didn't realize it. It's possible that in his estate somewhere there's a, <laughs> there's a shipping box that's never been opened. Okay, that's probably the last time I'll open that up. Ever. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that, talk about an irreplaceable item. That's irreplaceable. That is irreplaceable. And I know, and Mujica saw my pictures of this toy, so he liked it. He would have liked to have had one. Uh, he was impressed with it, and I know he he wanted one, but uh, I don't know what happened to it. According to his people, he didn't get it. I don't know. That's sad. Okay, this is probably the most personal 
perhaps the most precious uh, item in my Coffin Joe collection. No, that's not a biological <laughs> fingernail. It doesn't have any DNA in it. This is a prosthetic fingernail. It's made of resin. But that is an actual prosthetic fingernail from Embodiment of Evil. How would that have gone on? Like maybe like that, perhaps. And I don't know. It looks like something for a little finger. Yeah. It looks like it's a design for a little finger. So that is a prosthetic resin fingernail from the movie. It did break in half on its way from Brazil to here. And so I super glued it back together. I don't know if you can see the seam. I can't see where it is. Maybe if I, on video, maybe I can see it. With my naked eye, I can't see where it broke. But you know, most of the ones on the set broke too. So when I was shooting, we went through several sets of nails when I was shooting that swamp thing, swamp thing, <laughs> swamp scene. When I was shooting the swamp scene, every time we did take the note, the nails broke. Um, so I had to stop, they had to put new nails on me, and then I could go back down and come up. First they were falling off from the water, the, the adhesive would come loose, and then they started taping the nails to my fingers. And then then I'd come up and they were broken half. And yeah, so they went through a lot of nails. They when they got down to the last set of nails they had available that day so we couldn't break those and, and, <laughs> and somehow those survived after a dozen other sets broke so the fact that this broke doesn't surprise me that, that just makes it more authentic but there it is an actual embodiment of evil movie fingernail coffin joe fingernail That's what they look like. And they didn't put any makeup or anything. They just glued them on. You know, they didn't paint it or put latex over it or something. They just glued it on. And even in the uh, 60s films, Coffin Joe's nails are prosthetic. I think I said that last time in last week's shoot, which you just saw a half hour ago. Um, even in the original films, in the 60s anyway, his nails are fake. He, he didn't start growing his real nails out until later. In the 70s, then he's got real nails in the, in the 70s movies. But in the 60s, they're, they're prosthetic. Okay, so now... You know, another thing I don't think I really stressed enough about why Coffin Joe is such an interesting character. He's, a, he's an evil character. He's really a despicable character. He's one of the most heinous characters ever put on film. He's horrible. I mean, if you think Alex from A Clockwork Orange is bad, Coffin Joe is a lot worse. Um... So, you might say, well, why is he so fascinating? Well, there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons. He's strangely fallible. That's one reason. In, in he's always railing against God, and then supernatural things happen to him. Uh, like, he, he's yelling at God, saying, you, you don't exist. If you exist, show me a sign. And then lightning strikes a tree, and the tree falls on him. And then the first thing he says is, this does not convince me. <laughs> so, every movie, everything he believes is proven wrong within the world of the film. And he, in the second film, he's 
sorry for things he does and he apologizes to someone. Um, how many monster characters apologize? So he's got, he's a complex character, but one of the things I really like about him is the fact that he loves children. Not in a, a sexual way, not, not in a perverse, creepy way, but in a, in a sincere, uh, paternalistic way. He, he loves children and he wants, he believes they need to be protected and treasured and he hates anyone who harms children or threatens children. He's, he's sincerely very uh, pro-child and in every movie with, with the original continuity Coffin Joe, not the later like alternate universe type versions of Coffin Joe, but the original Coffin Joe Awakening, um, Edmund, I'll take your soul, this night I'll possess your corpse and embodiment of evil. There are scenes where a child is in danger, being threatened, and Coffin Joe will chastise someone who's yelling at a kid, or there, there's one scene where Coffin Joe risks his life to save a child from being run over. Um, and then in Embodiment of Evil, there are some police that shoot some kids and then Coffin Joe rounds up all the police who were involved with that and tortures them to death, abducts them and puts them in his dungeon in various heinous ways, tortures them to death. So he's, the, he's a protector of children. Instead of a boogeyman that might be hiding under your bed, he's there to protect you if you're a child. Now, if you're an adult, if you're an adult, he's gonna kill you. If you're a child, not only do you not have anything to fear, he's going to protect you. Even risking his own life, he's going to protect you. So that is, that is an unusual horror character. How many horror characters love kids and protect them? And the juxtaposition of that with how evil he is in every other way is really fascinating. I'm glad Mojica put that little wrinkle in his character he put a lot of wrinkles in his character, a lot of layers and complexity, but that's the best one that he made him so evil, so despicable, but he loves kids and he, and he doesn't just passively love them. He protects them and saves them and advocates for them. That's, that's interesting. Well, here is an interesting book. The title is from Godard to Zedo Cacho, Jean-Luc Godard was a very important, very famous, very influential French New Wave director. And the author photographed Godard in Brazil. I assume that Godard was there for a film festival or maybe to promote one of his new movies. This is uh, a book by Ivan Cardozo, who is a, a Brazilian filmmaker, friend of Mojica, made a lot of movies, a lot of movies, mostly satires, comedies, and he's been making movies since at least the 1970s, maybe earlier, but at least since the 1970s, and he is, he's sort of like the, the comedy version of Mojica. If Mojica's Batman, then Ivan's the Joker. But they were always very, very tight throughout Mojica's life, and Ivan's still alive. Uh, I'm actually Facebook friends with him. And, this, and he's a photographer, among many other things. Ivan's a photographer, and he made this book of photography that chronicles the underground art scene in Sao Paulo. And I think there are some Rio pictures in here too, but mostly Sao Paulo. This is, this is a, a photographic history of the alternative underground art scene. And when, when did this come out? Because I 
I got this in the early 2000s, right after I started getting into Coffin Joe. Oh, 2002. So it wasn't long after this came out that I got it. And I, I, there's, I, it's, it's difficult for me to show you pictures because there's so much nudity in this book. Okay, I can show you. Just randomly open this up. Well, that's pretty, pretty typical, the kind of pictures, you know. A lot of artists from that era. Well, when I say that era, from the 60s through. What's this? I don't know. Brazil culture. Oh, so I bought, that's the story I bought that from. Um, let's see what's interesting. I don't know. Let's just show you this one. Those are the kind of pictures in here. I've got to watch it because a lot of the pictures are have a lot of nudity. There's no nudity in there. Let's see if there's a picture. There's lots of pictures of Mujica. But you gotta find them. They're not all in one place. Well, no nudity there, but <laughs> scantily clad. You can see there's a vampire. That's that's not that's not Mujica. That's some kind of a vampire movie he's making. Nah, uh, nudity. Or some yeah, nudity. <laughs> that was interesting. You may wonder why am I showing you this book? Why am I showing all these goofy pictures? These are not Coffin Joe. Sexual, but that's well. There we go. I said sexual, meaning. Uh, there, it wasn't nudity, but it was a very sexual image. It was someone putting their hand down their pants. So, no nudity, but not something I want to show on the air. <laughs> uh, but this, this is okay. I can show this. Um, there, that's Mojica. And there's other pictures of them. Those are two good ones. There's one with him and Zebra Malo, like from that album shoot. Well, it's really, it's fascinating to me, probably not so fascinating for you to watch me <laughs> look at it. I don't know, we just randomly just choose this. This is interesting. So you get the idea. And there's text too. There's, it's not all pictures. There's, I'm showing you the picture pages because those are more interesting than text, but there's text. So. And you can see, obviously, Majik is on the cover, you know, along with Godard. He's sprinkled around throughout the book. So, oh, hey, this is a good picture of him. Look at this. Eh, that's a nice picture of Majika. Look at his nails. And those would be his real nails. At that point, he was growing out his real nails. So those are, those are real in that picture. Aren't they? I think so, yeah. Um, so why did I show you that book? Okay, so I bought this right when I started getting into Coffin Joe, and I was just consumed with this. Um, I, was, I loved Coffin Joe, I just discovered his films. It was, I got my first uh, something weird tapes, because the uh, Fantoma DVD set only had three films in it. But I, I filled in my knowledge of Coffin Joe with watching the Something Weird uh, videotapes until these bigger Brazilian DVD sets came out later. And there wasn't a lot... There wasn't a lot out there. There wasn't a lot in terms of uh, movies to watch, like home video, DVDs, v VHS. Not a lot of merchandise at that point. I couldn't get my hands on it. 
this book really was a window into that world, that, that world of uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, Sao Paulo, underground art scene that Mujica's part of, that he came from. I would keep this under my bed. And every night, I would open this book. Before I went to bed, I would open this book, I would just page through it. And I would will myself into this world. I didn't intellectually understand exactly what I wanted to do or how I wanted to do it. But I just, I was trying to, if you've seen like somewhere in time where Christopher Reeve uh, uses his power of will to look at, look at something and will himself back in time to another place, another time where he finds Jane Seymour. I mean, that's not what was in my head exactly. That's kind of um, after the fact, thinking about what I was doing. It's like I, I was trying to will myself into this world. I just wish I could have been, been there in, in Brazil and been part of this. And it sounds strange, but I feel like it had something to do with me getting that part in that film. It's like, oh, I, I once knew a guy who had very basic tastes, and, <laughs> and he talked about how if you wanted a Lamborghini, you put a poster of a Lamborghini on your bedroom wall. And every day you'd look at that poster. And before you go to bed every night, you look at that poster. And you wake up every morning, you look at that poster. And if you do that, eventually you're going to have a Lamborghini. That's the way he, he that was his, his theory. And I've heard other people say things like that. And uh, I mean, there's, what's it called, actualization or something? I don't know. There's, there's a, wor a word for it. And I don't know if I was consciously doing that. But subconsciously, I, I'm sure I was. I was trying to make, just by the power of my will, trying to make something happen, something that I wanted to happen. Even I didn't quite understand what it was I wanted to happen. I just, all I knew was I wanted to be in this book. I wanted to be in this world. I wanted to go into this world somehow. And I remember when I was in Brazil thinking about this book. I might have even brought this with me, I don't know. But I remember very uh, thinking that it worked, that I did it, that I, I willed myself into that world, and now there I was. If this book had been published you know, like in 2010 instead of 2002, I probably would have been in here. Well, probably would have been one of those pictures. So... That book was important to me. I, I, you know, I don't believe in the supernatural, but I kind of, it's weird. I'm inconsistent, just like Coffin Joe is inconsistent about that. I'm inconsistent about it. I, I, I really do think if I had not gotten that book, I wouldn't have gone to Brazil. I really do think there was some connection there that in some way I did wheel myself into that world. Just like Christopher Reeve in Somewhere in Time. Okay. Here's the... Here's the special box. <laughs> this is this, this extra special stuff. All right. Oh, before we before we look at the special stuff, let's talk about posters. Um, obviously, I can't I can't get uh, one sheets out and try to sh I'll destroy them. I'm trying to show them to you, so you're gonna have to watch a slideshow of some digital images. But everything you're gonna see are actual posters that I own. These are 
my pictures of my posters. These are not images taken off the internet. This first one is obviously Mojica. It's a video that he made and sent to me on Facebook, and he's holding the poster that's hanging on the wall behind me. And he's talking about the poster, explaining it. And as I said before, as far as I know, the only surviving copy of the original poster for At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul is the one that Mujica owned. I've never heard of anyone else having one in their collection anywhere. I've never seen a picture of one hanging anywhere or heard anyone talk about owning it. And believe me, I've asked around. The second film in the Coffin Joe series is This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse. And this is the standard one sheet for that film. This is a, a classic, iconic Brazilian movie poster. It's strangely abstract, minimal. You'd think it would be more literal and more lurid. It's more suggestive. And it's, it's interesting, it's very artsy poster. It's an artsy kind of image. But this is one of the classics of Brazilian cinema, this, this, this the movie and this poster for the movie. This very same poster was used in conjunction with promoting the film at the Sitges Film Festival in Spain. I don't know what year exactly, but it was soon after the movie re was released. It wasn't a, a later screening. It was, a, so I'm assuming, like a late 60s screening. So uh, this is obviously a, a treasured piece in my poster collection. Now this is a, a poster for the same film, and they call this the Continental version. And I don't know, I don't know why they call it that. I don't know if the distributor is called Continental, or if they meant this is, was used to promote the film elsewhere on the South American continent, outside of Brazil, or if they mean perhaps uh, it was for the, the country of Portugal in Europe. I, I don't know why it's called the Continental version. I've never been able to find that out, but that is what this versions called it like we have in American movie posters version A or version B or style A style B one sheets with this film there's the standard one and there then there's the continental one which is what you're seeing and it's also a very rare poster as far as I know outside of Mujica's estate the one I own is the only known example of this poster and it came from the collection of another Brazilian director. And he had it for a while, and I asked him if he would part with it. He didn't want to. And then a couple of years passed, and then he decided to sell it. And luckily, I got it. It's, it's glued to a masonite board, which is not the way to preserve a poster, unfortunately. Uh, and I've talked to different poster restoration studios, and they've all told me, just, just leave it. <laughs> It's, you know, just, it, it's better off just leaving it like it is instead of trying to get it off that board. Um, but, I mean, it's as many Coffin Joe posters are, it's, it's, it was not in great shape to begin with, but it's a survivor. It's very rare to find minty Coffin Joe posters. They're survivors, the ones that exist especially the old, the earlier films, they're survivors, and you just got to appreciate that they exist at all. So I'm very lucky to have this poster. And as, as you can see, it takes a much, much more literal, lurid, pulpy angle on the film. But it's also, I think, more accurate in terms of depicting what you're actually going to see when you watch the film. Um, yes, the film's moody, you know, you know, it's atmospheric, but it's also very pulpy, it's very lurid, it's very grindhouse. It's, it's not some kind of um, Swedish art film. It's, it's a in-your-face, 
grindhouse drive-in horror experience. And I hope that does not uh, they might sell it short. I mean, it's a very good movie, but it is an entertaining film, and, and the experience of watching it, I think, is better captured by this more lurid poster. Some would disagree. And I actually think that that second film, Miss and I'll, I'll Possess Your Corpse, might be Mojica's best film. And, and perhaps the... And other people have agreed that... Would, I've heard other people say this, that it's perhaps the greatest uh, the greatest Brazilian horror movie ever made. Now, the, the third film is The Strange World of Coffin Joe, and I do not have the poster for that. The only paper I have for The Strange World of Coffin Joe is this. This is a Korean advertisement. But that is what the the one sheet for The, the Strange World of Coffin Joe looks like. That's the poster. And this is a 21st century Korean advertisement. A promotional flyer. And, it, and there's the back has various images of Coffin Joe or information about the films. This that's as close as I I have to any kind of movie paper on that third film. Unfortunately, the uh, once again outside of Mujica's collection, there's only one known surviving example of the one sheet for the Strange World of Coffin Joe. It's in really rough condition. And it's in a collection in, in Brazil, and the owner, of course, doesn't want to part with it. It was used in a museum exhibit a few years ago. It was on display, which is how I even know it exists. And people are taking pictures of it and posting it on social media. It's rough, I and mean, it could be restored, but it's, it's kind of rough. But it's, as far as I know, it's the only surviving example outside of Mujica's family. I'm sure they have one, but and Mujica had one. That would be my number one. I mean, obviously, I'd love to have the original one sheet for At Midnight, I'll, tell, at midnight, I'll Take Your Soul, but I'm not going to find that. Um, but I feel like it's possible to find Strange World of Coffin Joe. There must be one out there somewhere. There's that, that one that I know exists. There must be another one. And I really love... That image, that is just, that is Coffin Joe. <laughs> I mean, that's what it's all about. That just captures the whole thing, the whole phenomenon. I, I would love to have that one sheet. So that is the, the top of my want list as far as Coffin Joe posters. But let's go back to the slideshow. This poster is for... Ritual of the Sadists, better known today as Awakening of the Beast. The film that we know as Awakening of the Beast started as Ritual of the Sadists, but the Brazilian government wouldn't let Mujica release it. And I don't know all the details. I mean, the, the legend is that the government banned the film. It, that might not be exactly accurate, but the film could not be released at the time. Years later, after the dictatorship fell, Mojica was, and after Mojica was uh, undergoing a, a reappraisal in, in the popular culture in Brazil, he reissued the film under the title Awakening of the Beast. But this is a poster for that original aborted release when it was still called Ritual of the Sadists. And as far as I know, it, it never had a theatrical run under that title. I could be wrong, but it's my understanding. It just had a few screenings and that's it. And it never actually played in theaters under that title. But it's one of the most iconic Coffin Joe images. I just love that, that image. That just... 
that that's coffin joe the the luridness the inappropriateness the transgressiveness the snakes the spiders that gigantic tarantula coffin joe just laughing at the whole thing diabolical laughing it's just madness it, it, the whole thing is just it's insanity and it looks like something you shouldn't watch you look at that image and you think ah, I, don't, I don't know if I should watch that <laughs> which is what which is what you should feel when you look at a, a coffin Joe image now here is awakening of the beast so this is when the movie finally did get out there years later it was retitled awakening of the beast and, and this this poster is much more accurate as far as depicting what you actually see in the movie the film chronicles various social problems you see different different walks of life different people throughout society involved in drug abuse and sexual fetishes and it's kind of a reefer madness sort of a, a take on the underbelly of Sao Paulo and then at the end you have an LSD trip where several people think they're taking LSD and they they see Coffin Joe and it's it's really the best it could very well be the best Coffin Joe sequences ever put on film he's only the character is really only in it at the end but it's worth the wait and it, it you don't feel cheated that he's only there at the end because once he's there it's amazing and it, it, the, the film is really great as a as a time capsule kind of like kind of like that book that Ivan put together the film is a time capsule of, of that period in the late 60s and, and you see the popularity of Coffin Joe uh, because in the film Coffin Joe is a movie character in the film so people in the movie Awakening of the Beast go to a theater and watch a Coffin Joe movie and Mujica is there as the director Mujica in various scenes being interviewed or talking to people so Coffin Joe is a movie, a fictional movie character within the world of that movie. So you see the the actual Sao Paulo, the actual Brazil, and you and you hear about the popularity of Coffin Joe. And you see things like, uh, like one at one point a character walks into a, a poster shop and buys a Coffin Joe poster, or you hear like we were, um, you saw that record album they had the novelty songs on it you hear one of those novelty songs on the radio and people go and you that uh that uh, uh this nile possessor corpse poster the standard version the abstract one where he's lifting his arms that's hanging outside a theater and people go into the theater and watch that movie there's a a, a talk show where Mojica appears on the talk show and they're talking about a comic book that he publishes and then later you see a, com a comic book stand that has the comic books for sale and it says we have the complete series of Coffin Joe they're talking about the the comic books and I'll come back to that in a minute so it's it's a great film to to show you what a phenomenon Coffin Joe was at that time he was really a multimedia phenomenon he was in the movies he was on TV, he had his own shows, he was also a guest on several shows, he had a comic book, he had products. He was, it was something else for a few years there. He was a real phenomenon. And this particular poster, Awakening of the Beast, is special because this came from Forrest Ackerman's collection. This was from the Acker Mansion and Mojica autographed it to Forey Ackerman. This is autographed from Mojica to Forrest J. Ackerman. So you have two giants of the world of fantasy and horror 
represented in this poster. And I think that's, that makes it very special, very, very special. I actually have another copy of this poster that came direct from Zika, and it's in much better condition. This one from Forrest Ackerman's collection, this is kind of rough, but because of the, that autograph and the, the history behind it, this is the one. If, if there was a fire and I had to save one or the other, I'd save this one because it, it connects the world of Brazilian horror to the world of Hollywood horror and fantasy. Forrest Ackerman's very much part of the, the Hollywood scene and very instrumental in popularizing the horror genre to the monster kids in the late 50s through the 60s and 70s. There's something historic about it. So this is an important poster to me. Now let's look at the Strange Hostel of Pleasures. And something weird put it out on VHS as Strange Hostel of Naked Pleasures, but that's not the real name of the movie. This is a film that Mujica didn't actually direct. He stars in it, he, I think he produced it. He sort of ghost directed it, but it was a, a pupil of his that directed it. And, and people say Mujica really directed it. It's kind of like Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper and Poltergeist who really directed that film. People say Mujica really directed Strange Hostile Pleasures. I don't know, it's not up to the standards of Mujica's other films at that time, so I'm not sure. The poster is better than the movie. This poster is just amazing. Good golly, that poster is beautiful. So atmospheric. I mean, it's really, it's an incredible image. The one I have has a little bit of tape residue. I, I don't remember if the tape's on the front or the back, but you can see it on the front. So someday I'd like to have that restored and linen backed. And I've seen this poster sell for a lot of money. The, I mean, it's out there. there. This is not the only one that exists. There, I've seen, I don't know, a half dozen other ones. But this one can go kind of high. I, I think it's just people recognize this as an incredible image of Coffin Joe. One of the definitive images of Coffin Joe. Um, and you know, I'm going on and on about how great the poster is, but I don't really have a whole lot to say beyond that. The movie, it, it's kind of odd. Coffin Joe is, uh, he's not the original Coffin Joe from the first two films. We've already left that continuity. And now we're into these alternate universe versions of Coffin Joe. And in this one, he's running uh, a hostel. He's running a hostel in Brazil. and. A bunch of different people come in to spend the night at the hostel, and then we realize there's some there's a there's a twist that's not that hard to guess, but things are not what they seem. But Coffin Joe himself doesn't really do a whole lot; he just sort of presides over the whole thing. It's not one of my favorite Coffin Joe movies. I wish Mujica had directed it, and and Coffin Joe had been more instrumental in what was going on. But but it's a great poster. And this is another one of the, I mean, which of these is not? I was going to say this is one of the iconic <laughs> Coffin Joe posters. They're all iconic. They're all amazing. This is Black Exorcism. Something weird put this out as the bloody exorcism of Coffin Joe. But it's Black Exorcism in Brazil. This was Mojica's uh, highest budgeted Coffin Joe movie, but uh, it it it, it kind of has a TV look because he wasn't using his own regular crew. He was using a crew that I think was more accustomed to TV type production. So the it doesn't look as stylish as most of his other films, but it has the biggest budget. I I think he actually got more out of his his smaller budgets on his earlier films. He, he, the, Mujik, even though he directed, he stars, he writes, he directs, he's, this is his film, but he didn't have complete creative control over it. There was a producer, he was hired to direct this by a producer who wanted to cash in on The Exorcist. 
And Mujica said, oh, sure, well, I'll make you an exorcist film, no problem. And, and then he proceeded to <laughs> make a Coffin Joe movie instead. And much like Awakening of the Beast, in this film, Mujica plays himself. He plays the director, Mujica. And Coffin Joe is a movie character. But Coffin Joe comes to life. He crosses over from the movie world into the real world and causes trouble. So this, again, it's not the same con continuity as the first two films, but it is, it's, it's Mujica's creation, Coffin Joe. It's not some guy running a hostel or whatever. It's, it's Coffin Joe, all right. It's Coffin Joe, but it's a much more feral, basic, elemental, evil Coffin Joe. The desire to protect kids is gone. This, this Coffin Joe wants to sacrifice a kid to uh, uh, create a satanic master race. Uh, he's, he, part of his plan requires a blood sacrifice. And Mojica is the one trying to protect the kid. And that kind of, and the whole theme of the movie is where does Mojica end and where does Coffin Joe start? Who's, is Mojica Coffin Joe? Is Coffin Joe Mojica? Like, where, where do these two personas, how do they overlap? Where does one begin? Where does the other end? And it's kind of interesting that in this movie, Mojica is the one who's protective of kids, not Co Coffin Joe is the one who wants to harm kids. So then would you say that the earlier Coffin Joe movies where Coffin Joe is protecting kids, that's really re a reflection on Mojica? Well, of, of course it is because he's the creator of the character, but that, that's the whole question of the movie. Who's the creator? Who's creating who? <laughs> So it, it's, he tries to get some interesting philosophical questions in there, but it, it's a lesser effort. Um, it was hampered, I think, by just not having creative control over the whole thing. I think if Mujik had had complete control over it, it would have been much better. But this poster, this poster is an amazing, iconic poster. And for a long time, it was very, very, very hard to get this poster. The only example anyone knew of was the one, one that Denison Romalo owned. Um, and he had a hard time getting it. He was quite proud of his. But then I think there was a small find of maybe, a, I don't know, a half dozen of them came from somewhere. I, I, I think the, the producer of this film died, and I suspect when he died, that some of his belongings got sold, and that's how a few of these posters ended up on the market. Uh, and then, obviously, I, I got this one, and it's minty. That's why I also think it must have come from his estate when he died, because it's uncirculated. It's a beautiful mint condition poster. Very happy to own this. And since that, that one little release of a few of them, all like in the same year, there was a few that became available. After those were bought up, they were gone. I've never seen another one for sale since. So I'm glad I jumped in there and got this one. This movie is Inferno Carnal, Hellish Flesh. That's the US title anyway. Coffin Joe is not in this movie. Mujica plays basically a mad scientist. This is actually a pretty good movie. It has an EC Comics kind of a style. It's a it's a revenge tale, and it has a twist. And I didn't see the twist coming. It really surprised me at the end. It's quite a twist. Now that I've told you that, if you watch it, you'll now you'll see it coming because you know to expect a twist. <laughs> Once you know there's a twist, then you, you'll be able to figure it out. It's very artsy and very strange. It's kind of short. I think it's only an hour, a little over an hour. But it's actually a pretty good movie. Uh, this scientist gets burned by acid. There's a love triangle, and his wife uh, plots to kill him, but he doesn't die. He just gets badly burned. But instead of trying to harm her, he seems like he wants to help her. He, he starts financially taking care of her and, and, and being very kind and that's kind of strange like why is he doing that 
it's an interesting story. It's an interesting poster. This is one of the, I don't know how, it, I don't know about the current market, but you know, like a decade ago, it was one of the more common Coffin Joe posters. It was easier to get this. You, if you really wanted one of these, you could, you could find it. I don't know if that's still the case. I haven't seen one in a while. And this movie is Perversion. It's got different titles, but uh, the title for this poster and the one that's most uh, often associated with is Perversion. Kind of a sister film to Hellish Flesh, a, a very similar film. Mujica doesn't play Coffin Joe. He plays a, a rich guy. I don't know where his money comes from, but he's, just, he's a rich guy. And he mutilates a young woman just for, for fun. He thinks it's funny, and he shows it off to his rich friends. Uh, when I say shows it off, he, he cuts something off of her and then shows it off. And they all laugh at it. Then her sister decides to to take revenge. And it goes into, into some unexpected places, emotionally, psychologically. It doesn't unfold the way you think it will. The very end is sort of, sort of what you think is going to happen, but the way it gets there is very interesting. It doesn't take a path that you think it's going to take. Um, this is not a great poster, obviously. <laughs> It's kind of basic, and it's kind of small, smallish poster. Uh, let's look at this one. Hallucinations of a Deranged Mind. At least that's a something weird U.S. title. Hallucinations of a Deranged Mind. This is a clip show. This is the clip show of the Coffin Joe series. This is a movie made up of clips of all the past Coffin Joe movies. There is a, a framing story to kind of tie it together. It's, it's much like uh, Black Exorcism, where Mojica is Mojica, the director, and Coffin Joe is a, a real presence that becomes real, that leaves the world of the movie screen and becomes a real threat in the real world. And that's the the framing device, but most of the film is comprised of clips from past Coffin Joe movies. It's just sort of a best of compilation of Coffin Joe movies, of scenes from Coffin Joe movies. And the, the poster is very nice. This is another one of the easier to find Coffin Joe posters. The, the, the most common ones would be Awakening of the Beast, Hellish Flesh, and this one, Hallucinations of a Deranged Mind. Those will be your entry-level Coffin Joe posters if you want to start collecting Coffin Joe paper. Incidentally, this Hallucinations poster is autographed by Mujica. A lot of this stuff is autographed by Mujica. I'm very fortunate that a lot of my Coffin Joe memorabilia has his autograph. I also have this press book for Hallucinations of a Deranged Mind. Obviously there's a little bit of nudity on the cover of this book. Now some of the other posters have nudity, but they're paintings. This one is a photograph, so uh, I hope it'll fly under YouTube's radar. I don't want to edit. Mujica's work. I mean, either it, <laughs> either I can use it or I can't, but I, I'm not going to edit Mujica's images. Now, this is not a Coffin Joe movie. This is an Ivan Cardozo movie, Secret of the Mummy, but Mujica's in it. He's not playing Coffin Joe, but Mujica's in it. And it's something of interest to Coffin Joe collectors, and, and something weird put this movie out on VHS. This is a 1970s horror comedy. And this is the kind of thing Ivan Cardozo is known for making. And I have it just, you know, because Mujik is in it and it's often talked about when people talk about Coffin Joe movies, it's often, often included in, in the discussion. So 
And uh, this is the only example of this poster that I know of. I don't know how rare it is, but I've never seen another one. This is the only, only one I've ever seen. And this is the embodiment of evil. This is the movie that, that I was in. And I'm showing you a, a digital image. So this isn't my paper poster. It's just so easy to, to get a digital one that uh, I didn't. I didn't want to take mine out of this tube because it's got a little tear in the side, which it sustained in Brazil because uh, it was actually in the theaters promoting the film. And so when they took it down from the wall, it got a tiny little tear in it. Um, not 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 bad just like a little centimeter just a little thing i mean i'm a little hypersensitive about that but i just that's why i don't want to take it back out and risk <laughs> messing it up uh so I'll just use this digital one I mean, it looks the same that's the poster art for embodiment of evil and it's a pretty nice coffin joe image it has a kind of collage look like they took Coffin Joe's face and pasted it on a body from somewhere else. It, I think it deliberately has that off kilter look. It's sort of like a collage, like something a, a psycho might have put together by cutting up other photographs and pasting them together. But this, this image, I think, summarizes what the movie is all about pretty well. I think it gives you a good taste of what the film is all about. And that's my slideshow. Um, I think I have a few other things, but frankly, sitting here, I can't remember anymore. So we'll just stick with that. I think that's enough, right? You've seen enough. It's like watching a vacation slideshow. Like, here we are in front of the tower, and here we are at the bridge. Yeah, so you don't need to see any more of that. Okay. Um, well, here's a, there's Liz Vamp again, and Majika and Liz Vamp autographing that. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, oh. No, no, no. Here. Okay, so here's... That's Liz Vamp, but this is the back. I showed you the wrong back. So that's just Liz Vamp. Majik is not on that one. Autographing that to me. And now this is the one that had both of their autographs. That's Liz Vamp and Coffin Joe. And this is one of the most iconic images of Coffin Joe from This Night I'll Possess Your Corpse. And there's his autograph there. I don't know how, I, this is going to be like a four hour long video. But at least when it finally comes out, you'll know why it took so long to make it. I'm trying to, I don't know if, it, if this is going to come out or not. Here we go. I do want to show this to you. So I'm taking this, I'm daring to take this out of its wrapper. Okay, so this is a Brazilian TV guide. I don't, I'll, I'll look and see what year it is, but I think it's 69-ish, something like that. It's a Brazilian TV guide. What year is this? Um, I'm sure it says somewhere. <laughs> this old paper just crumble in your hands. Wow. Yeah, I, I don't know what year it is, but I'm thinking 69. If, if, if not, then it's close. This is the kind of stuff you have inside. Here's, here's the back. And there is a story on Coffin Joe. I mean, here's other, I don't know who this is, but this is some of the other stuff that's in it. And I just hear the TV listings. There should be a date, right? I mean, it's, it's a TV 
10th of November, but what year is it? I don't know. So where's the Coffin Joe po uh, story? But I like this because it just goes to show you how mainstream, in a way, Coffin Joe was for a while, for a minute there. And it occurs to me when I was talking about black ex black exorcism, I should have noted that I, I said it kind of had a TV-ish look. It's also set during Christmas. There's Christmas trees and Christmas presents and Christmas songs. So it really is like a Coffin Joe Christmas special. It's a very special Coffin Joe Christmas so if you want to know, if, is there any such thing as a Coffin Joe Christmas special? Black Exorcism is a Coffin Joe Christmas special. I mean, it kind of looks like a, t a TV special. And it's set in Christmas. It's a TV special where there's horrible violence and lots of nudity and very objectionable stuff. But it's still, it's set during Christmas. Okay, I, I'm not going to give up before I find this story. It's right, it should be right up here. Okay, I just spent about 20 minutes trying to find this story in this TV guide. I don't know why it took so long. But you, you won't see any of that. We'll just cut right to this. So here is the story on Coffin Joe. There's Zedukai Show. And I believe this is promoting his television show. This isn't about his movies, this is about his TV show. And the TV show does not exist anymore. They, as they often did with TV shows in the 60s, all over the world, they taped over it. They didn't think anyone would ever want to see it again. Just like Doctor Who, just like The Tonight Show, just like all kinds of shows. They, taped over the episodes. I didn't think it, it was any any market for the future. They, they, they couldn't make any money from it again. Didn't think anyone would ever want to watch it again. So why save it? Because videotape was expensive. Videotape was expensive. They couldn't, they couldn't archive stuff unless it was like a moon landing or something. They, they weren't going to archive it. Interesting, the only... This just popped in my head. The only reason we have Dark Shadows today, the network, ABC, wanted to tape over it. The producer, creator, Dan Curtis, insisted that he take possession of the tapes. I guess that was in his contract, that when they were done, he would get the tapes. So that's why we have dark shadows today. Otherwise, they would have just taped over it. They wanted to tape over it. He said, nope, I want those tapes. Now this looks like a, a Coffin Joe comic book. But it's actually, or like a Coffin Joe children's book, but it's actually a, a religious tract. This is Coffin Joe, it's a story about Coffin Joe meeting the devil, and it's a, a religious fable, it's teaching a religious lesson. And uh, it's in the internet age, because it has a URL. I'm guessing early, two, like late 90s, early 2000s. So that's not, that's not from the 60s. Well, that's interesting. Maybe they would use Coffin Joe for that. And there's a, oh, there's a children's, I think, is it l like Looney Tunes Babies or something like that? Uh, there's like a video game that's got Coffin Joe as a character, or, or maybe it's a videotape where he's, he's on it. It's weird. I don't think I have anything for that. I really should. Uh, unfortunately, I don't. But that, 
that that is just how much Coffin Joe became mainstream. This is a program for that Chiller Theater convention from the 90s, a historic convention, because that was the first time Mujica made any public appearances in the United States. I think it was the first time he ever set foot in the United States. And that's what the t-shirt looks like. It's this image in green like that with the Chiller Theater Expo logo. So I can't find the shirt. I have it somewhere, but I've got this program at least. So at least uh, you can see what the shirt would look like. But this is an important artifact of Coffin Joe history. And this, I think, this is one of the first publications that had a Coffin Joe story that started to talk about Coffin Joe in the United States. And uh, this is an image from Black Exorcism. Now, I want a leisure suit like that. I want a leisure suit just like the one Mojica wears in that film. I think it's pink. I love that leisure suit. I want one just like that. And here's another one of the early early fan publications to talk about Coffin Joe. 1994. That's a fan magazine with an article about Coffin Joe. And that's from 1994. This is American, this is US. Shocking images. This is a Sunday supplement. This is Brazilian. This is a Sunday newspaper supplement. Um, it's from Sao Paulo. Like 1980, 1972? 78? Let me see here. 78, August 1978. So this is a something that would have been in newspapers in Yeah, some interesting images here. Especially this one here, that's from Black Exorcism. That's a, that's a rare image to see outside of the film. That, that photo of Coffin Joe is hanging on the wall in that movie, and that's kind of important to the plot. And I can't think of another time where I've seen that image published outside of the film. More Coffin Joe material. And once again, I just like anything that is. Because Coffin Joe is such an underground thing, and yet it became so mainstream, so, the, so pop culture in, in Brazil. I, I, like, I, li I like that. I like that something that's so anti-mainstream would become so popular and, and have stuff like this. I have a full set of hallucinations of a deranged mind lobby cards. And a lot of these cards 
have nudity or gore, so I don't know how many of these I can show you. But uh, I mean, this is not a very interesting image. Just a guy screaming. Yeah, I'm not going to take these out of the plastic. I just saw it's very reflective. Uh, nope. <laughs> a lot of nudity there. Uh, let's see about this one. Well, this is a um, kind of a boring image. Of, it's just Mujica talking to people. And in this movie, he is playing himself. He's playing the director, Mojica. And then Coffin Joe is, he's a movie character in this movie who comes to life and comes out of the movie. So that was a theme, the second half of Mojica's early career before the 80s when he had the, the downturn, before he made his comeback in the 90s. That first part of his career is, the Coffin Joe movies are divided into the, the real Coffin Joe or a flesh and blood Coffin Joe to this sort of meta Coffin Joe which which is aware that he's a movie character and in some way influences the real world either by literally stepping out of the movie or simply by being a psychological influence on people. This is a great image um, there's some nudity but I hope it's not too bad. So there's Coffin Joe with uh, a woman in his enthrall. And that is a wonderful, evocative image that really captures Coffin Joe. I mean, just, yeah, he's got a naked lady there, but just the, the pose and the, the, the look of the whole thing. Now, I really like this one. As I said, this is a hallucinations is a clip film. It's clips. It's like a clip show, and this image is actually from Awakening of the Beast or Ritual of the Sadists. And I love this sequence in the movie, and I like this actress too. I don't know her name. She does turn up in some small parts, background parts in other Coffin Joe movies, but she has a large part in this movie in Awakening of the Beast. And then the clips from that movie are used in hallucinations. Well, too much nudity in this one. <laughs> Let's see if I can show. It's got pinholes. You can tell it's been used. It's got pinholes. Let's see how much of this I can show you before it gets to be a problem. OK, I guess we'll stop there. <laughs> That's a nice image, though. And this again is from Awakening of the Beast. This is a, a clip from Awakening of the Beast that's used in Hallucinations of a Drange Mind. Another wonderful image of Coffin Joe being Coffin Joe. S same sequence from Awakening of the Beast. It's a great sequence. Awakening of the Beast, like I said, that ending where Coffin Joe finally enters the movie is just fantastic. And this is from that ending. Coffin Joe is up there with the text going across his face. <clears throat> okay. Let's see here. All right, I've got a complete set of Coffin Joe comic books, vintage ones. Now, they, they made Coffin Joe comic books in the 80s and 90s. So what I have here are the original 60s comic books. Let's clear some space here. We'll put these in here for now. I 
I'd like to have more Coffin Joe lobby cards, particularly uh, Black Exorcism. I really like the lobby card set for, for that film. There's also an Awakening of the Beast lobby card set. And the official Coffin Joe website does have that for sale. It's kind of expensive. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little pricey. But they do have the set of the original Awakening of the Beasts lobby cards on that website. Maybe one day I'll break down and, and buy those. But I'd really like to have the Black Exorcism ones. The, of the ones that survive, like the, I've never seen lobby cards for the first few films. Only like the 70s forward. Of the lobby cards that exist, the Black Exorcism set I think is the best. Uh, and I, I haven't seen one of those for sale in, in a long time, but that's that's the set I really like to have. Uh, and the Awakening of the Beast one too, even though there's some overlap between that and the Hallucination set. Um, so about these these uh, um, comic books in Awakening of the Beast, as I said, there's a scene where a character won't walks past a shop and it has a sign that says we have the complete series of Coffin Joe comic books and since I saw that scene I I wanted to have the complete series of Coffin Joe comic books uh, and in that same movie there's a scene where Coffin Joe where Majika is on a sort of like a reality TV show for that time for the 60s where he's being kind of put on trial uh, to determine whether he's a legit artist or whether he's a charlatan. And there's a bunch of cultural experts quizzing him, and one of them takes his comic books and throws them on the ground, saying they're, they're worthless. Um, so the comic books are kind of a big part of that movie, and the opening titles for that movie are images from the comic books with the titles superimposed over them. Well, actually, it's superimposed. It's not an optical. It's just they put scotch tape or, or some kind of light colored tape over the comic books and then wrote on it. But that, those are the titles uh, in Awakening of the Beast. So there's, the whole comic thing is very, is very much a part of that film. And the Fantoma boxed set had little miniature versions of those comics. And I don't remember. This is now the third day of shooting this. <laughs> and there will be a fourth day. Uh, I don't remember if I said what happened to that box set. My brother gave me the box set for Christmas. And then I, I gave it for safekeeping to a very special friend many years ago who still has it. So I, I know it's still there. And uh, I'm happy with it where it is. Uh, I don't, I don't need to need it back. I'm uh, someday I'll buy another one. I just like to have it in my collection, but uh, that's why I don't have it here for you right now. So that set though had little miniature versions of these comic books. Not all of them. I think four. Uh, there was. There was three discs, DVDs in the set, and each one had a little mini comic in it. And then there was an additional comic, like a bonus comic, in the box set, the coffin box set. You could also buy the DVDs individually, but in the coffin box set, there were four mini comics. Now, they were not exact reproductions. They were, in fact, they only had a, I don't know, maybe half, not even that, of the content that's in the real comic books. I think there's only one story in each of the mini comics, and there's multiple stories in the real comics. So the mini comics are cute, and they're in English. That's good, but they're not—they're uh, not exact replicas. Um, I'm very—I'm not going to take all these out. Um, these are really irreplaceable. I, I only know of one other complete set in existence that I've ever heard of. There's one other person out there who has a complete set, but it's very rare to have these things. And if you if you have one, you might have one or two, but you're not gonna have all of them like this. 
so it took a few years to get these and some money but it, it was it was difficult to round them up strangely there's a there's one of these this is issue number two and right before I start working on this episode one of those popped up on eBay and that's the first time I've seen one for sale in a long long time years it's still there as of this recording I think it's priced at three hundred dollars and if I didn't have it I'd I'd buy it I'd, I'd already clicked buy it now but I've got one so I'm, I'm very cautious about handling this this is the first issue issue number one of the strange world of Zedo Kaisho this original comic book from the 60s it's the first issue The back is something about Nostradamus. And I have, I know there are Portuguese websites that talk about the artists who were involved with these comic books. Apparently, um, some very notable Brazilian comic artists were involved with these books. So comic book aficionados in Brazil are very interested in these books. They're considered classics. I'm just going to, I'm not going to page all through this. I've had, I, I, I like, as you know, MIB uh, Master Toy Room, his, his YouTube channel, and he will take um, Vampira Warren magazines and he'll page through them and he'll, he'll show the, like with a, I guess it's a phone he's using, he'll s scan the, the page and you can read the magazine with him. I wanted to do something like this with these, but first of all, they're very fragile, very old, and they're irreplaceable. It would take me 20 years to try to track these down again, if I could. And um, particularly outside of Brazil, they're very, virtually impossible to find. And they're in Portuguese, so I don't know if the viewer would really get much out of that. They're in Portuguese. So that's an example of a page. It's very Warren-like. I wouldn't say it's like EC. I'd say it's more like Warren. Warren comics. Like eerie and creepy. And there are uh, pages with photos from the Coffin Joe movies where they They use photos from the Coffin Joe films and make a comic book story out of it. There's a word for that genre. I, I, it's fallen out of my head. I just heard it used a couple days ago, but I don't remember. So these are, and then there are, there are photo stories that are not from Coffin Joe movies that are made specially for these magazines that did not previously exist as a Coffin Joe movie. I'm trying to show you something. Okay, that's... So Coffin Joe uh, appears in the magazine. What would be a really good example of this? Well, let's go to the front. And these evolved over time. So this is the first issue and of course things changed over time. So you see right away there it's got Coffin Joe's image inside and the inside cover. And then he will turn up in the story. So he's like the Crypt Keeper. And he's telling you the story. So the, he, Coffin Joe is narrating these stories. And he, his face turns up as a photograph in just every few pages you'll see his face appear as he's sort of commenting on what's happening. So 
let's put let's put this one up. I'm getting nervous about this one. Um, we'll look at the second one because if I damage it, hey, I know where to get another one. Just go out on eBay. There's one there now. Well, we'll do that later. Put it back in its little baggie later. There. Here's the second one. I think this is the only other one I'll take out of its bag. I don't want to, I'm not going to take all of these out of the bags. There are some visual, recurring visual elements in these comic books that I didn't see in that first one. So maybe they'll be in this, this next one. And once they started adding some of these elements, they maintained it throughout. But they didn't have it in the first issue, apparently. Here's the second issue. Strange World of Coffin Joe. And a lot of the images in these comic books comes from the movie The Strange World of Coffin Joe. And that character is Professor Oshik Odez. Oshik Odez. That's Zedukai Show backwards. And he is an alternate universe version of Coffin Joe. And in that universe, Coffin Joe is a successful author who goes on talk shows and promotes his books. It's like a bizarro world, Coffin Joe. But he's still Coffin Joe. And he's still evil and still does terrible things. And he lives in the same house that he lived in in the first two movies. And he has a servant played by the same actor. But whereas in the second movie where the servant comes in, he's got a hunchback and he's disfigured. In Strange World, Coffin Joe, it's the same actor, it's still a servant, but he's not disfigured because it's alternate universe version of him. And this isn't speculation. This is what Mujica says. Mujica says that's what he is. He's an alternate universe version of Coffin Joe. There is a Coffin Joe multiverse, and there's all these different versions of him in, in different realities. So, what do we got here? Here's the back. It's a story about Rasputin. Let's look inside. This is the inside. A little image of Coffin Joe there. Well, huh, I don't know about this image. <laughs> um, now I'm going to go ahead and show it. Okay. And there's the inside. And there's an interesting image there where it looks like these, it looks like the thing started it infected two girls and started making out with this guy and then started to turn into the thing. And that's what it looks like. That's not what's going on, but that's what it looks like. And do they have the things I wanted to show you? Are those in place yet? No, they're not. Well, this is interesting, though. You've got at the bottom of the page, there's a woman kind of entombed, like she's in a casket. It's the same woman. And let's see if they repeat that every page. Yeah, they do. So that's on the, the bottom of every page. So they start doing that. Every page has, a, has an image on the bottom that, that recurs throughout the story. Here's Coffin Joe again talking about the story. Let's see if it's that woman through the whole thing. It is. It never changes. Yeah, I don't think I can show that image. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe I can show the bottom. Okay, let's put this this one up. Well, let me see what the photo 
story is. Here's examples of the photo story. Again, that's those are images from the strange world of Coffin Joe. This is in beautiful condition. That's why I really don't want to don't want to mess it up. I'm not gonna find him in that condition again. Um. Let's see. Well, let me just show you the front of that. That's the third issue. And this image is probably from an audition. So Mujik would do these crazy auditions and he would get a lot of publicity for making all these people do crazy things in his auditions. And it was, you know, it's a publicity stunt because it would get press. He became known for these weird auditions where he would get people to eat bugs or uh, cover themselves with snakes or tarantulas or something or or take off their clothes and of course the press was invited and it was supposed to be going too far it was supposed to be the the press would be like this is shocking how dare you you can't do this <laughs> that was the whole idea it was it was a publicity stunt and it worked, and, and his auditions became legendary. And then people wanted to be in his auditions. He, people didn't participate not knowing what they were getting into. They, were, they became very well known, and people wanted to go through that and experience that, whether they ended up in a movie or not. And again, this is another image this time in color. Well, the other ones are in color too, weren't they? Let me see here. Well, no, no, the other ones are black and white with color backgrounds. This is full color. And that's also the strange world of Coffin Joe. I mean, the, the name of the comic book is The Strange World of Coffin Joe. And not only did he have a, a movie called The Strange World of Coffin Joe, he had a TV show. The TV show came first. The movie was really a movie version of the show. The, the TV show came first, and then he had the movie. Okay, I'll take this one out. Man, this is in good condition. I'm kind of impressed with it, just looking at it. It's like uncirculated. Um, okay, so here's the, the bottom image in this one. They all have these different bottom images. Each, each issue has a different image. It's at the bottom of each page. And one of them has a, like a silhouette of Coffin Joe. I guess that's one of the ones I didn't open. There's some beautiful artwork in these things. I'm trying to see what what images can I show you? Wow, this is like it's never been opened before. Okay, I'll show you this. That's from the movie The Strange World of Coffin Joe. What's a horrific image? Lots of grave robbing going on. I 
I kind of like this grinning image of Co Coffin Joe. He's amused by whatever's happening in the story. Okay, let's let's put this one aside. Now, after so this is issue four. Um, yeah, let's just put this over here. After that. It changed. He, Mujica changed publishers. And the next two issues were smaller and had a, di a different visual style. That's issue five. And the cover is wonderful. That is a great cover. He's using these people as marionettes. He's the puppet master. what's going on on the back here. And this is probably the most famous cover. It's issue six. You see that one reproduced a lot. And it's just a great image. Once again, it, it really sums up Coffin Joe. You see the top hat? So this is number six. Now these were supposed to be quarterly, but as time went on, they became, I think maybe the first few did make it out quarterly, but then they became more like every six months or Every year, the schedule started to slow down because Mujica had problems uh, with these publishers. And I'm sure they would say it was his fault. He would say it was their fault. But whosever fault it was, there were problems. And that's why he would keep changing publishers. And that would slow, slow things down even more. So he was not really regular about getting all these out. So even though it's issue six, that doesn't mean it was six months or a year and a half. I don't know how many years passed, but it's at least a couple of years or more during the time these six issues came out. This is neat. So here we have images from a, a movie that doesn't exist. <laughs> these are these images are were taken. Th I mean, this is almost like a lost Coffin Joe movie because this movie only exists in this comic book. It's interesting. of what this is like. These pages are so perfect. I'm, I'm a, it's like these, I don't know where these came from. I, mean, I know I bought them from Brazil, but they're, they're just so, I mean, you can tell it's, they're, they're vintage. It's obviously a very old paper, yellowing, browning paper, and it's getting crispy. It's very fragile, but you can just tell that no one ever thumbed through these things. They're, they're just perfect condition. You can see what this is like, though. They're, it's all photographs, but that's not from a movie. All of this stuff it was done for this comic book. See how the story's proceeding. They're in a graveyard. That's not from a movie. That's that's created for this. I 
and I don't know what's what they're all upset about, but something's not right. <laughs> ah, inferno. So that's enough for this book. Uh, I don't want to mess this up. This is the first time I've taken these things out of these bags in a long time. If they were kind of raggedy, I might say, oh, the heck with it, Why? whatever, but they're perfect, so I want them to stay that way. Okay, so that was issue six. Then the last two issues, seven and eight, these are the rarest ones, and, and they're very different. Um, and this one's a little rougher in condition, so I'm not going to take that out of the bag. These are very, very, very hard to find. Nobody has these. Except that one, that one collector that I heard of, and he, he posted a picture of his collection. He's, he's got these two last ones. I don't know anyone else who has the whole set plus these two last ones. So, the final two episode, two um, issues, the name changes to Coffin Joe's Reign of Terror instead of Strange World of Coffin Joe. Coffin Joe's Reign of Terror, and you could say, well. Doesn't this count as a, a new publication? This is number one. Well, it followed up. They're considered the final issues of this run because after that, they didn't continue with a different comic book. Years later, there were graphic novels, uh, but those are a different thing. And here's the here's the back of that. That is a great image of Coffin Joe. That is just wonderful. Look at that. Nice early 70s Coffin Joe. So this says two photo novels or photo novellas. I guess that's as good a name as any of what a lot of the stuff is. They're photo novels. It's a mix of illustrated comic books and photo novels together in the same editions. Well, this one's in nice shape, so maybe I'll take this one out. Yeah, I think I'll chance it. So they got these two last issues out under this new name, and then that was it. As far as I know, Coffin Joe never had another regular comic book. He would have graphic novels and standalone things, but not a recurring periodical. There we go. Again, really wonderful, wonderful art. Really evocative. That's Coffin Joe for sure. And then images of the last, and I could be like, do you have this previous edition? Well, you better, you better get it. And this is definitely, this is number two, and that one says number one. So this is the one that came after it. Wow. Great artwork inside. That's a nice image of him. For sure, that's a great Coffin Joe image. <laughs> so some kind of a, oh, I don't know what's going on here. This guy's having a consultation that's not going very well. Coffin Joe's commenting on it. I like that image. Again, that is not from a movie that is created for the comic book. Interesting images. 
it is like they're like lost coffin joe movies that only exist in these pages okay that's enough well, let's see what the opening page is yeah and it it does have i mean they're not all photo novels this first story is definitely an illustrated comic book. I'm trying to find a really nice um, spread to show you something scary happening. Oh, this is, oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so here's the end of the story. Spoiler alert. We've got people skinned, hanging from meat hooks. And Coffin Joe's talking about it. So let's see who ended up on these meat hooks. Let's see what... Haha. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess this guy is the serial killer, the crazy looking guy. And I think he's gonna open up a refrigerator or a locker or something and show the skin people hanging inside. But you can see it's a, it is a comic book. It's like an EC, not EC, it's like a Warren, you know, creepy, eerie kind of comic book. So even these last two are still comic books. They're not all photo novels. They're, and they have illustrations. They're illustrated. Oh, I can already hear it kind of cracking the spine. So, ah, uh, no, um, no. Okay, so I say, I, I'm very aware that I say so too much. That's a tick. I've got to learn to stop that. That's it. That's it. The complete series of Coffin Joe Zedukai Show comic books. Eight total. And these are some of the holy grails of Coffin Joe collecting. If you're going to collect Coffin Joe, that's, there's the posters, the, the movie paper, and there's the comic books. And those are some of the main things that you want to go after. And then a little more modern would be like the something weird videotapes and all the different DVD editions. As of this recording, there's no Blu-ray of Coffin Joe. For, I'm not going to get into why, but there, there, there are no Blu-rays yet. Hopefully Arrow Video will come out with a Blu-ray set. They're working on it. Uh, we'll see what happens there. There aren't any vintage, well, there are no vintage Coffin Joe toys, but I'll put a little caveat there. There, I've heard that there was some kind of a, of a doll or a figure or something from the era when the movies were originally made, from the 60s or the early 70s. And um, Coffin Joe's son, his nickname is Crow, uh, he was in Brazil, I asked him about it, and he said yes, and he made, um, he, he made a, a gesture with his hands, like how tall it was, it was like, like this, he said. He was like, like, oh, yeah, 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 like like that. And he said it was very hard to find. They were looking for one to put in the museum. At that time, the Coffin Joe Museum was still open, and they couldn't find one. And a friend of mine knew a, a dealer in Brazil who told him, oh, yeah, I saw one of those at a flea market last week. I'll see if it's still there. And then next weekend he went there and it wasn't there and he said that's something that's very very rare 
you, but no one really wants it. So when you do find it, it doesn't cost very much. It's just a few bucks. But uh, finding it is the problem. That's what he said. So I, I don't know what what this figure doll, whatever, I don't know what it is, what it looks like. Does it really exist or was was Crow misunderstanding me? Was this dealer talking to this friend of mine? Was he misunderstanding him? Was he lying? And, and I, I, I read a, a story about Coffin Joe, like a news article talking about the popularity of Coffin Joe in the 60s and 70s, saying like there were all these different products made, including, there was like a list of things, including, it, I think it's its small figures or something like that, fi some kind of figures. And I showed you that bust, that was from the museum, that's a, a 21st century piece. So I don't know, I don't know, if, is there a doll, like a vintage one? Is it a statue? What I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever know for sure, let alone find it or own it. But that's a that's an interesting little semi mythical toy. That's that's like a white whale that's out there that doesn't even exist. I'd like if it exists, of course I want it, but doesn't I don't even know what I'm looking for. I don't even know. I don't. I mean, it would probably be very difficult, even if I were living in Brazil, to find that, let alone from here. That sums it up. That shows you the the range of things that that exist for Coffin Joe. There's a lot of stuff, of course, that I don't have because it's so rare that. Uh, uh, the only known example would be one that Mujica owned, or even maybe not even that. I'd like to have a little bottle of that Mysterio cologne. The bottle itself, I've seen pictures of it. It's boring looking. It doesn't look like what you think it would look like. But I'm thinking it probably came in a little box or something that might be more interesting. That would be cool to have that, but I'll never have that. Uh, but that's another thing I'd like. I don't know what else to say except uh, I'm, I'm not a lot of things have gone right in my life. I will just put that out there. Not a lot has gone right for me in my lifetime. Coffin Joe is one of the few things that went right. It's one of the few times where I thought things things went right for once and for once I, I tried to kick the football and instead of Lucy pulling it away I actually kicked it <laughs> and it went pretty far um, I'm very proud to have been part of the strange world of Coffin Joe part of his world part of his history part of his legacy and for a long time, it, it seemed like something, something that happened just the other day, just a few weeks ago. But lately, maybe it was COVID, maybe it was Mujica passing away. Lately, it does feel like something that happened long ago. Something that's a part of history that is in the past. Something that happened to another person. And in preparing for this episode, I, I went over my uh, online diary, Diary du Demonio, and I'll put a link to that in the description so you can check that out. And it brought back a lot of memories and made me very nostalgic and kind of homesick for a home I never lived in. <laughs> uh, it, it, it made me kind of wistful. Uh, it would have been nice if that little moment of my life could have been extended and more of my life could have been like that. But for a moment, I, I felt at home. I felt like I was on my home planet for once. 
uh, instead of an alien stranded on some strange world, I felt like I was able to visit my home planet for a little bit. And then it was back to, back to being stranded again. That experience was very important to me, and I'm glad it happened. And I'm sorry that Mujika got sick, and the embodiment of evil didn't make as much money as he really wanted it to in order to help give him some momentum to make another movie and another. That's what he was, hope he was hoping would be a big hit, and then he'd be able to get more projects off the ground. And he tried anyway, even though it wasn't a big hit. He tried, um, and it's just too bad that he couldn't have gotten another couple of films out to add to his legacy, because he was really entering a new era of his career after a long drought. It was not self-imposed. It was imposed on him. He didn't want to spend all those years not making movies. He, he would have liked to have made movies continuously from the 70s all the way into the 21st century. It just didn't work out that way. And just as he, it seemed like he was entering finally a new phase of his career in his lifetime where he could start making movies again, things happened and it didn't work out. And he, he got sick in his last few years of his life, he was sick and then he passed away, and that's sad. Embodiment of Evil really stands as a, as a what if, what could have been, if, if he could have gotten a new series of films made, and he would have had one last era of his filmography, what would it have been like? What kind of movies would he have made? What would they have been like? but at least he got that one made. And it's kind of a miracle that he did. I'm glad I was part of that miracle. And I understood very well this idea of a curse. He thought he had been cursed in life, and I do too. I've often felt like I've been cursed. And maybe that's why, part of why I, I'm attracted to werewolves and vampires and these cursed characters. Majika didn't like those. Those were too American. He liked Brazilian horror characters. His daughter Liz Vamp likes vampires. He was like, oh, no, no, vampires are not Brazilian. Coffin Joe was Brazilian. He was very proud of that, creating a Brazilian horror character. But he thought that that experience with uh, um, this night I'll possess your corpse with the government forcing him to change the ending, he felt like that put a curse on him. And I understood that. And it was really important to get that, that third movie in the trilogy made, even all these years later, just to break that curse. And he did. He broke that curse. And I'm the one who helped him break it by making that, that, flashback where we undo the damage that was done in that previous film. We fixed it. And that curse was broken. As happy and proud as I am to have been a part of that film, I'm particularly proud that I helped him break a curse. At least we got one curse licked. We broke one curse. It's too bad he's not here. Everyone's got to go sometime, but uh, even though I didn't have a whole lot of contact with him because of the language differences, cultural differences, geographic distance, it was nice having some contact sometimes and just kind of knowing he was out there and being able to share a little communication now and then. I guess it's time to wrap it up. What's this? Okay. You see that, right? Okay, it's gone. Where'd it go? There, right there. Okay, what the heck is this? I'm 
I'm trying to do something serious, and and we have this going on with the pack. Oh, give me a break. Is this for real? Oh, okay, what? Is this a joke or what? Come on, stop this. Hey, hey, hey cut the head. Stop it. What? What the heck? I, I'm not doing this. What is this? Get away! Hey! Get away! Get away! Hey, get away! Você. Você? O todos. Vocês.